In the middle of November, Jim Schofield was cleaning out his attic when he came across a box of children's books he neither recognized nor remembered. He brought them downstairs, intending to do what he always does with books he doesn't want. He was going to take them to the library and push them through the return slot. By Friday afternoon, the books had made it as far as his front hall, which is where Jim happened to be standing when he spotted Rashida Chudry pushing her daughter Fatima up the street in her stroller. Rashida and her husband Amir moved into the neighborhood last winter. Everyone took great delight in helping the Chudrys through their first winter in Canada. When it snowed, people woke up all over the neighborhood wishing they could be at the Chudrys to see their reaction. Jim grabbed some wrapping paper from where he keeps it, under the sofa, (laughs) and he quickly gift-wrapped the books, and then he ran outside. An early Christmas present, he said, handing the children's books to Rashida and pointing at her daughter. Jim said the thing about the books being a Christmas present so Rashida wouldn't think he was odd, running out like that. He gave her the books, and then he went inside to fix dinner, and he forgot about them completely. Rashida didn't, however. Rashida went home and freaked out. (laughs) Rashida and Amir are from Pakistan. And this was going to be their first Christmas in Canada. Jim clearly said it was an early Christmas present, she told Amir that night when her husband arrived home. Do you know what that means? Amir shook his head disconsolately. It surely means this whole neighborhood gives each other presents. Amir and Rashida spent November in a frenzy of preparation. They assembled elaborate gift baskets for everyone in the neighborhood. Each basket had little packages of aromatic rice and tamarind and homemade chutneys. They stayed up late sewing little cloth bags for the spices. Now things at Dave and Morley's house were more comfortable in the run-up to Christmas. (laughs) Morley has been paring back her Christmas responsibilities over the years. She has pruned her shopping list. She doesn't do as much baking as she used to do. Dave cooks the turkey every year now. (laughs) So this year, as Christmas approached, Morley felt uncommonly sanguine about the season. She felt like she was floating above it, like a swimmer floating in the ocean. She felt such a sense of control that she even sat Dave down one night and they sent Christmas cards to his Cape Breton relatives. On an impulse, Morley sent a card to Rashida and Amir. By a terrible coincidence, it arrived the morning Rashida and Amir finished making their neighborhood Christmas packages. (laughs) Oh my golly, said Amir, not cards too. Unlike Morley, Dave had been preoccupied with Christmas since the end of November. The neighborhood arena holds an annual skating party every December, and this year they were trying to raise money for a new Zamboni. Dave went to an organizing meeting, and and when he went, he knew he wouldn't leave without some responsibility. Before the meeting began, Dave overheard Mary Turlington talking to Polly Anderson. He flips a few steaks on the barbecue, and he thinks he's cooked a meal, she said disparagingly. She was talking about her husband, Bert. Baking, said Polly Anderson, that's the final frontier. Show me a man who can bake a cupcake and I'm all his. (laughs) They both cracked up. (laughs) At the end of the meeting, the chairman passed a typed list of jobs around the table. Dave looked down the list and without a second thought put up his hand and he said, I'll bake the Christmas cake. He said it for Bert Turlington. (laughs) He said it for all the men in the neighborhood. Said it for men everywhere. And that is how, on a Saturday in the middle of November, Dave came to be in his kitchen, surrounded by brown paper bags of sultanas and currants, and lemons and figs and dates and prunes and nuts and glazed cherries, 
and a giant jug of bourbon. <laughs> he was wearing a Santa Claus hat. <laughs> Autumn dimmed, and the rains of November arrived, and the street lights went on earlier each night, and the wind came up, and the leaves blew off the pear tree in the backyard, and it was good to be inside. And inside, at Dave's house, life was sublime. Dave had his cakes wrapped in cheesecloth and aging on a shelf in the basement. Two or three evenings a week, he would head downstairs and sprinkle them with a soaking mixture he made with the bourbon. It's a very European thing, he said one night. It's, it's like having a goat down there. I don't pretend to understand everything he says. <laughs> Sometimes on the weekend, Kenny Wong came over and they'd go into the basement and sprinkle the cakes together. <laughs> on Grey Cup weekend, Dave and Kenny watched the entire game without touching one beer. They sucked on half a fruit cake each. By the middle of December, Dave was ready for the arena big time. His remaining cakes were moist and mature and, truth be told, delicious. Dave had eaten two of them. He'd nibbled them both to death. He had the remaining dozen lined up like gold bars in a vault. Amir and Rashida had their gift baskets ready to go, too, wrapped in cellophane, tagged and waiting in the front hall. But a sense of anxiety had descended upon the Chutteries. Amir and Rashida didn't know when the neighborhood gifting would begin. <laughs> Knowing nothing about Christmas traditions, they didn't want to jump the gun. It wouldn't be right, Amir, said Rashida. We must wait. And then there was a party at Fatima's daycare, and all the children were given presents. And that night, Rashida said, I am thinking, Amir, that the gifting has obviously begun. We have not been included because they do not want to make us uncomfortable. If we're going to be part of this neighborhood, Amir, it's up to us to make the first move. Amir thought otherwise, and they had a steamy argument about what to do. But in the end, Rashida said, I am going tonight, and that is it. If you are coming with me, Amir, you must come tonight. And so they set off after supper, pulling their wagon full of 28 gift baskets. When Rashida handed Morley her Christmas basket, Morley was seized with a spasm of guilt. She was ashamed of herself. She had been working so hard to minimize the hassle of Christmas. And these new neighbors, these new Canadians, had so clearly been embraced by the spirit of the season. She invited them in, and she put their basket under the tree, and then she said, I have your present upstairs. <laughs> and she flew upstairs, and in a panic, she grabbed a lovely glass bowl that she had picked up at a craft show. It was already wrapped, and she had been planning to give it to her mother. See, said Rashida to Amir 15 minutes later, as they pulled their wagon along the sidewalk, they were waiting on us, Amir. <laughs> It took Amir and Rashida three hours, but when they finished, they had left baskets all over the neighborhood. The next morning, Morley noticed a tiny rash in the crook of her elbow, a spot that often flares when she's feeling pressured. While she was drying her hair, she told Dave what was bugging her. I gave the Chudrys that pretty glass bowl. We've lived right next door to Maria and Eugene for 18 years, and we've never given them anything. And Gerda, too. If I give something to the Chuddery, surely I should give something to Gerda. She could feel the muscles in the back of her neck tightening. <laughs> As she headed downstairs for breakfast, she was trying to figure out when she'd have time to shop. Morley went to a flower store at lunch, and she bought two bunches of holly. She was planning on taking one to Eugene and Maria next door and one to Gerda. She was planning to do it after supper. Before she was ready to leave, the doorbell rang, and there was Gerda. 
standing on the stoop beside a wagon full of presents. Uh, Christmas cookies, she said. I, I baked for everyone in the neighborhood. There was a tiny muscle ticking under her left eye. On the weekend, Morley dug through her emergency stash of presents looking for something to give Mary Turlington. I wouldn't want Mary to learn I'd given something to Gerda and not to her, she said. She found a pair of hand-dipped candles. They were warped. She took them downstairs thinking she could straighten them out if she warmed them in the microwave. You've tried this? After she had scraped out the microwave, (laughs) Morley dashed to a neighborhood store, arriving just before closing, and she bought a gift basket of herbal teas for Mary. On her way home, she bumped into Diane Goldberg, (laughs) who was pulling a wagon up the street towards her house. Wagon was full of presents. Morley couldn't believe it. Everybody knew the Goldbergs didn't celebrate Christmas. Morley said, what a coincidence. I just put something under the tree for you. By the Friday before Christmas, Morley had received 10 gifts from neighborhood families including two baskets of herbal teas identical to the one she had given Mary Turlington. One of them looked like it might have been the exact same basket. Her rash had extended down to the wrist. With only three shopping days left, she came home from work and she found a small bottle of strawberry-flavored virgin olive oil from a family down the street she had never met. She stood in the kitchen staring at it, scratching. Damn it, she said. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that was also the afternoon Dave closed the vinyl cafe and came home early to ice his Christmas cakes. His plan was to fit them together like a jigsaw puzzle and seal them with a sugar paste. And when he finished, he realized his cake was now far too big to fit into the fridge, which is where the baker told him it belonged. The only place Dave could think of that was both cold enough and large enough for his icing to set was in the garage. Ever so carefully, he picked the cake up and he struggled out backwards using his elbow to push open the door. And on the way into the garage, he stumbled against the door frame and he knocked one end of the cake and a piece fell off. And Dave headed back into the kitchen and set the cake down on the table and went outside to fetch the broken bit. But the piece was not where it had fallen. Dave looked around the yard and there, heading up the pear tree backwards, was a squirrel dragging the broken bit of cake in its mouth. Dave squeaked and leapt in the air. The squirrel squeaked and leapt in the air. It dropped the cake and disappeared up the tree. Dave retrieved the piece of cake. He bought it inside and he cut off the bit that he thought had been in the squirrel's mouth. And he tried to set it back in place. But the more he fiddled with it, the more the piece refused to fit. It was rapidly losing its shape. Eventually, using a mixture of honey and icing sugar, Dave made a sort of cement and glued the hunk of cake back on. (laughs) Used the last of the sugar paste to cover the joint. It was easy. It was just like doing masonry. (laughs) And then he carried the cake carefully out to the garage, the squirrel nattering at him as he walked under the tree. And he set the cake on the roof of the car. my Buddhist friends would tell you to stay in the present moment. (laughs) 
He set the cake on the roof of the car and made sure the garage door was tightly closed on his way back inside. It was an hour later that Morley came home and found the strawberry-flavored olive oil. Every night, she said, every night I come home and someone else has left a present. What is wrong with these people? (laughs) She was scratching her arm vigorously as she left the room. Dave was sitting at the kitchen table making little marzipan snowmen for his Christmas cake. Morley came back into the kitchen with her coat on and she looked at Dave and said, I'm going to the drugstore. Anyone else who shows up here is getting chocolate. And as she flew out the door, she said, those look more like mice than snowmen. You can't put marzipan mice on a Christmas cake. Dave waited until she left and then he flattened the ball of marzipan in his hand and he threw it across the room for Arthur the dog. And then he said, "Uh uh-oh. This is where I catch up to you. (laughs) And he jumped up and he ran out the door. And he got to the driveway just in time to hear a squeal of tires. Just in time to see the red lights of his car disappearing down the street with his Christmas cake on the roof. He began to run down the street, waving his hands wildly, calling to Morley. He was running and waving when she hit the speed bump and the cake flew off. (laughs) He was still running and waving when Morley glanced in the rear view mirror and spotted him. Now what, she muttered. And she jammed on the brakes. And the car skidded to a halt. And she threw it in reverse. And Dave stopped moving. And he watched in horror as she reversed over his cake. And he started running again. But he wasn't running alone anymore, pounding along the pavement beside him like a racehorse stretching for the finish line, (laughs) matching him step for step in a rush for the cake. You got it. The squirrel. (laughs) Get out of here, Bellow Dave. Morley thought he meant her. She gunned the car and went right over the cake again. Dave carried his cake home the way he would have carried a dog who had been run over by a milk truck. You need professional help. He set it down on the kitchen table. He picked a piece of gravel out of the squish part. He got a screwdriver from the basement and a flashlight. He held the flashlight in his mouth and leaned over the cake like a surgeon. It took him 20 minutes to flick out all the gravel he could find. He went into the basement and poured himself a glass of soaking mixture. He came back a half hour later with a solution. He would cut the cake into individual servings and wrap each serving in cellophane like at a wedding. No one would have to know a thing. He got out the cake knife. When Morley came home, Dave had just finished the job. Morley was carrying a large cardboard carton. At first, Dave thought she had gone grocery shopping, but she hadn't. She had bought every box of chocolate miniatures left in the drugstore and a bottle of cortisone cream. (laughs) The skating party was the next night. Dave took his cake up to the arena an hour early and set it out on the refreshment table by the skate sharpening machine. He wanted to hang around and serve it to people. Fortunately, he had to go back to work and close his store. When he returned an hour later, there was a man standing by the arena door who didn't look at all happy. He was holding his jaw. Are you okay, said Dave. Man shook his head. Some idiot baked a fruit cake and left the pits and the dates. <laughs> You're kidding, said Dave.
When he got to the table beside the skate sharpening machine, his cake had hardly been touched. Someone, however, had altered the sign he had carefully lettered before leaving home. May contain nuts, it read. (laughs) Someone had scratched out the word nuts and written a new word in its place. His sign now read, May contain gravel. He was going to go home, but he spotted Sam waving at him from the ice, and he thought, who cares? And he waved back, and he held his skates up, and he headed toward the changing room. Christmas Day was a little strained in Dave's neighborhood this year. Gerda Lobier raided her freezer of all her Christmas baking for the cookie plates she gave to everyone. On Boxing Day... Old Eugene from next door realized he had given away the last of the year's homemade wine. Mary Turlington, who prides herself with her detailed Christmas record keeping, got so flustered with the neighborhood gift giving that she completely forgot to buy a present for her husband, Bert. I I can't believe it, Mary said, scrolling through her palm pilot on Christmas morning. I must have deleted you. The only house, the only house where Christmas went without a hitch was Jim Schofield's. When Jim's mother arrived, as usual, a few days before Christmas, she was amazed at all the festive flourishes. The candles, the home baking, the Christmas CD. It's all from people in the neighborhood, he told her. I've never seen a Christmas like it. People kept coming to the door with wagon loads full of presents. On Christmas Day, Jim and his mother went for a walk and ran into the Chudrys in the park. And they stopped and they talked for ten minutes, and Jim's mother made a fuss over Fatima. As they said goodbye, Jim looked at Rashida and said, What are you planning for New Year's? (laughs) New Year's, Amir said as soon as they were alone. New Year's, Rashida, don't these people ever stop? (laughs) It will be all right, Amir, Rashida said. Inshallah, her husband replied. Inshallah, God grant that it be so. Thank you very much. (laughs) 